You know, I want to share with you that we have finally started construction on our student housing, which has been one of the great needs for our Karis Bible College. We've had hundreds of people that have signed up and yet couldn't come to school just because we didn't have room. And you know, this coming September, we are gonna be three or 400 people above where we were last year. I don't know how we're gonna accommodate them, but we have begun to start building student housing. We've got the first six buildings approved. Our permit process alone was $1.3 million just to get the permits. And then we've already done $2 million worth of excavation. We're putting in the water and sewer lines now. We're beginning to go up with the buildings. And my reason for bringing this up is just to say that, you know, we cannot charge our students everything that it would take to build these buildings and provide the facilities. Right now, we've already produced over $130 million worth of buildings and assets, and we are in a building program that's gonna be much, much larger than that. So I'm coming to you, our partners, to say that if you have been blessed by this program, and if you would like to see other people just be discipled in depth and equipped so that they could go out and make a difference in this woke culture that we've come into. I'd encourage you to go to awmi.net slash campus and you can see a artist rendering of these buildings. There's a flyover where you can actually go inside of the buildings and look around at what we are projecting them to be like. And I'd encourage you to join with us and become a partner. We need a lot of people to help us in order to be able to fulfill this. So go to awmi.net slash campus, check it out and become a foundation builder today. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, celebrating 55 years of ministry. I'd like to thank you, Andrew Womack, for what you've done to me, what you've spoken in my life, for the, the grace teaching that you've brought. As I thanked you a couple years back, I still am growing from it, and I look forward to many, many more years of you teaching, and I thank you for that. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Monday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth Program. You know, uh, we've been doing something really special this year. This is the 55th year since the Lord changed my life. And here at our ministry, uh, we've been celebrating this. We've had all kinds of special things doing, and I've been thinking about this a lot. And you know, recently I sat down and wrote this little booklet entitled 20 Revelations That Will Change Your Life. And the way that this came to pass is that as I was just thinking about what God has done in my life, I had a miraculous encounter with the Lord in 1968 that got my attention and lit a fire on the inside of me. But you know, you can't live off of just a experience. Uh, and after a brief period of time, that experience began to wane and frustration set in and I didn't know how to uh, go from where I was. I had a glimpse of who God was and what He wanted to do in my life, but I had no clue about how to get from where I was to where God wanted me to be. And I actually had frustration and I guess you'd call it depression. I, I've never sat down and consciously thought about it, but I mean, I, I was just uh, at a loss of how to get anywhere. And I got drafted and sent to Vietnam. I'm going to be sharing more of this in detail. But uh, the Lord began to reveal Himself to me through the Word of God. And it was the Word of God and the revelation of God's Word that has changed my life. Now, the experience that I had with the Lord got my attention. And praise God for that. But I can guarantee you, you would not have seen me on television you, I would have never had the ministry that I've got. I would have never made the impact that I have if it hadn't have been for the Word of God and revelation knowledge is what I call it. Not just knowledge that you read something and intellectually you figure things out, but God just reveals things to you. There's many scriptures that go along with this, and I'll be talking about this in more detail. Let me start over here in 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 2. And the Apostle Paul was talking to the Corinthians and there had been a dispute about, you know, who they should uh, look to as their 
apostle over that thing. And Paul is the one that brought the gospel to him. And yet Apollos had come in and others were saying that they were of Cephas and others were saying, well, we only follow Christ. And so there was a division. And so the book of Corinthians, the first four chapters were written, Paul trying to get these people to get past this division. And he even said in the third chapter that as long as there's strife and division among you, you are carnal and you walk like men. Man, that's a huge indictment. And if you apply that standard to us today, then I guarantee you the body of Christ is carnal today. There is so much division. There's so much uh, hatred, even among Christians, for other groups who are Christians. And anyway, that's a separate subject. But as he was discussing all of this, he began to talk about that he didn't come using excellency of speech. It wasn't just intellect. It wasn't him being a charismatic person that he built his ministry upon. Let me just read some of these things right here. He says in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. You know, if you're trying to establish that you're the one who brought the gospel to these people and that you have the authority to speak into their life, and they ought to be honoring what you have to say. This is kind of a strange way to go about it. Most people today, when they want to establish their authority, what they do is is show that I'm the boss, and they wouldn't point out their weaknesses. And yet here's Paul saying, I didn't come with excellency of speech. I determined not to know anything among you. I was with you in weakness and in fear. You know, this is one of the things about the gospel that many people don't understand. But the way up in God's kingdom isn't to exalt yourself and to flex your muscle and to show people that you're somebody special and that God's with you. It's it's to humble yourself. When you humble yourself, then God extends more grace to you. First Peter chapter 5, and He exalts you. And so the way up in God's kingdom is down. And here's the Apostle Paul saying, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. Again, I could preach on each one of these things for a long time, but as a whole, our Christian realm today is more intellectual than it is from the heart. Now, I'm not saying that you don't use your intellect. Uh, I'm, I think there's some people that don't use their intellect. It's pretty obvious. But I mean, you, you, aren't, you don't just check your mind at the door, and it's not mindless, but it has to be beyond just mental intellect, mental assent. A relationship with God has to be heart to heart. With the heart man believes is what it says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 10. It's with the heart that you believe. You can't just believe out of your head. There are some things that go beyond just your ability to understand everything with your mind. This is what he's talking about. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. That means complete or mature. It's not talking about that you're sinless. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught. So he's contrasting that there is a wisdom of the world which is only mental and it's only looking at things in the natural realm and basing your beliefs on just things that you can see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. But when you become a believer, you have to go beyond just your mental understanding because you're believing in a God that you have never seen. You're believing that He can change you, which He doesn't just change your physical body. It's on the inside, things that are unseen. And these unseen things, the faith that you have, is what changes your actions and changes these visible things. So when you start walking with the Lord, you have to do it by faith. It says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, without faith it's impossible to please God. And so there is no way to have a relationship with God if you're just trying to figure everything out with your brain. You know, I was talking to somebody about this last night, and I forgot how we got off on it, but I I remember when I was in Vietnam, I was teaching a Bible study, and I had about six or seven guys that were in this Bible study. And a man came in late and stood there for a while, and then he got to asking questions, and he asked me questions that I couldn't answer. I was just brand new in the Lord. I didn't know very much of the Word. And he was asking me things that now I could answer his questions, but back then I didn't have a clue. I told him, I don't know. I I didn't know how to answer his questions. And anyway, he just ridiculed me. He made a fool of me. 
in front of all of these guys that were there for a Bible study. And he said, I'm an atheist. I don't believe there is a God. And he got up and he says, I'm leaving. Who will go with me? And all of my Bible study, all six or seven of these guys, they just got up and walked out with the atheist. He was more influential than I was. And it was not a good scene. And uh, so I was just sitting there thinking, God, what could I have done? Uh, how could I have answered these things? And you know, in about 20 minutes, this guy that was the atheist walked back in and sat down and he looked at me and he says, I want what you have. And I was just totally shocked and, uh, because I mean, he had made a fool of me. I couldn't answer his questions. The other people obviously thought his answers were better than mine. They left with him. And uh, I, I was just shocked. I said, you do? I said, why do you want what I've got? You just out talked me. You made a fool of me. And he says, I'm a Princeton graduate. He says, my whole life is based on intellect. And he says, I have all of these arguments that I've developed. And he said, I out-argued you and made a fool of you. And yet he said, you've got something that goes beyond intellect. You still believe. And part of what he was talking about was when he was saying, how do you know that there's a God? I didn't know all of the uh, answers to answer all of his questions, but I said, I know there's a God. I talked to him today. I said, he talks to me. He's changed my life. And I was just sharing with him things that I couldn't necessarily explain, but that I had experienced. I had a relationship with God, not just an argument. There's people watching this program right now that you're just kind of testing the waters. You're looking at a Christian broadcast and wondering what does somebody have to say, and you're trying to figure out God intellectually. And uh, you, may, you may think that, you know, I'm a fool for not uh, following your logic and stuff like that. But I'm telling you that regardless of what anybody else has to say, I had a call come in yesterday when I was doing a program and they said, how do you know that the Bible is inspired? And one of the ways, I, there's a lot of things I could share, but one of the ways I said, I know it's inspired because it inspires me. It's changed my life. The Word of God is alive. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. That means that it is living. It's a living Word. And when I read it, God speaks to me. So I was sharing these kind of things with that atheist. And even though he asked questions that I couldn't answer, it didn't change the fact that I know God. You can't tell me there isn't a God because I know Him. He lives on the inside of me. And this is what attracted him. And he came back in and he says, I want what you've got. And I was able to pray with this guy and lead him to the Lord. And he got born again. See, this is what I'm talking about is that there are things that come only by what I call revelation. It's not just you with your mind figuring everything out. Now, I'm not saying again that you don't use your mind, but you have to have it inspired by the Holy Spirit. And this is what Paul is talking about. He says, we speak wisdom. But it's not the wisdom of this world over the princes of this world that come to naught. Did you know we've got people today that claim to be intellectuals and they could have 32 degrees and still be frozen. That doesn't mean that you're anything just because you've got all of these degrees. The Apostle Paul was one of the most educated men of his day. And yet in Philippians chapter 3, he says, all of this stuff that was gained to me, I counted it but dung manure so that I might know Christ and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith in Jesus Christ. He took all of his intellect and all of the things that he had, and once he'd encountered the real God and he came to know Him by his heart, he didn't throw away all of his intellect, but he now analyzed and looked at everything through the revelation knowledge. And this is what Paul is speaking about right here. Did you know that the Apostle Paul was not one of the 12 disciples? These 12 guys that spent three and a half years with Jesus, of course, Judas hung himself, so after the resurrection, there was only 11 of them. But nonetheless, these guys spent day and night with Jesus for three and a half years. And yet Peter, who was one of the intimate, one of the inner circle with Jesus, when he read Paul's writings, he says, our beloved Paul says some things that are hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable wrestle as they do the other scriptures. The apostle Peter was saying that, the, that Paul's revelation is greater than mine. Paul is the one that got the revelation of the new covenant, the grace of God. 
And it even surpassed what Peter had. And Peter is the guy that spent three and a half years physically with Jesus. Paul did not spend time physically with Jesus, but after he had this encounter with the Lord on the road to Damascus, he went into the desert for three and a half years, and he came to know God by revelation. And he had a greater revelation of how to relate to God by grace than the people who spent three and a half years physically with Jesus in his physical body. The point that I'm making is that revelation knowledge is superior to just intellectual knowledge. You just trying to figure things out on your own. And this is what Paul is saying. And he goes on to say in verse 7, he says, But we, have, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. It's not a mystery. It's not something that's hidden from you. It's hidden from people who are just operating out of only your mind. Again, I am not saying that Christianity is mindless. It makes perfect sense but it doesn't make sense to the carnal mind. Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul wrote that the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh, another way of saying that is those of you who are only trying to figure out God mentally, you cannot please God. This is what Paul is talking about. We're speaking the wisdom of God in a mystery. It's not... It's not a mystery in the sense that you can't know it, but it's a mystery to people who are only trying to figure it out and they refuse to let God inspire them and lead them through their heart. So he says, "...even the hidden wisdom of God, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory." Man, there's a lot I could say about that, but that's great. It, verse 9, it says, "...but as it is written..." I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. And you will have a lot of religious people use this verse and say, well, you just can't understand God. You can't understand the things of God. Further along, we'll know all about it. Further along, we'll understand why. And they just basically embrace going through life. They get born again, but they don't know how to walk with God. They don't know how to receive from God, and they're just looking forward to heaven because right now, uh, you know, in the sweet by and by, it's going to be awesome, but in the rough now and now, they're just saved and stuck. This is a quotation from an Old Testament verse, and what it's basically saying is, with your mind, you can't see, you can't understand, you can't really comprehend God. God is way, way, way beyond our ability to figure Him out with just your mental mind. But the next verse, see, those who say that this is just the way that we're doomed to be until we go to be with the Lord, the very next verse says, But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, the deep things of God. And if you go down to verse 14, it says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. This is talking about just with your natural mind. You can't figure God out, for they are foolishness unto Him, neither can He know them, because they are spiritually discerned. This isn't saying that you can't know God, that you can't have a relationship with God, figure out how the kingdom works. It's saying that you can't do it with just your physical mind. You've got to have God reveal things to you. For instance, and I'll be dealing with a lot more things as we go through this series, but one of the things that makes no sense to the natural mind is what the Bible says, and there's many places, but Luke 6, 38, Jesus said, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. Did you know with your natural mind, if you need something, if you don't have enough money, to pay your bills or to buy something or to get something that you need, the natural mind thinks, how do I save? I've got to save. I've got to hold everything I've got. I've got to get more money. To the natural mind, the worst thing you could do is if here's your goal and you're here and you're short of it, then if you take a portion of what you've got and give it away, you're moving away from your goal. You have less now than what you had. And to the natural mind, this just makes no sense. But... Since there is a God who says that when you give, it will be given unto you. Did you know that the best thing you can do is when you have a goal and you're short of it, instead of hoarding, instead of not giving anything away, what you need to do is start giving. And by giving, you actually are moving closer to seeing that thing happen. Now, see, that makes no sense to your natural mind. 
And if there's somebody watching this that haven't got a revelation, if it hasn't become real to you through your heart, that God, when you put your trust in Him and you do what He says and take a portion of what you've got and you give it away, instead of you decreasing, you're increasing. That makes no sense to your natural mind. But that is the way that the kingdom of God works. So see, that's just one of the illustrations. Those of you that are sitting there thinking, what are you talking about? It doesn't make sense to your natural mind that when you need something, let's give something away. And that's the way that I'm going to get more. That, that's totally contrary to the way you think by yourself. But if you are a spiritual person, if you are letting God inspire you, it makes perfect sense that the way up in God's kingdom is down. The way to get more is to give away a portion of what you've got. Instead of hoarding, it's to give. It's to open your hand. And see, you have to have those things come by revelation. So all of this is an introduction to what I'm talking about is that as I just begin to start thinking about 55 years ago, March the 23rd, 1968, is when the Lord changed my life. And I've been praising God and celebrating this. And as I thought about it, the Lord just began to speak to me and say that you need to write down some of these revelations that came not just through intellect, not only through study. I'm not saying I don't study, but I, I study and then I pray and let God give me supernatural understanding and revelation of it. And these revelations that God has shown me has changed my life. And there's many more than just 20, but I just decided that I'd write about 20 of them. And also, let me say that this is, in a sense, a very short uh, autobiography. I'm sharing this kind of like in a uh, biography type of way. I go back and start talking about actually 65 years ago when I first got born again. And the first revelation that I got was about hell. And then I got a revelation about salvation by grace. And I just go through and kind of in a biographical way start talking about what God has revealed to me, how it's changed my life. And so we're going to give this to you as a gift. And I believe it'd be a real blessing. But I just want to emphasize that you have to have revelation knowledge, not just intellectual knowledge. The knowledge that you go to school and you acquire and you put it up here in your brain, you've got to in the spiritual realm, it's got to become more than just intellectual. It's got to become a heart revelation. And once, it's, once it changes your heart, once this knowledge and these revelations come from your heart, I guarantee you nobody can steal that from you. Satan, in a sense, can come and steal things from your thoughts, from your mind. But once you get something on a heart level, it, it, it's just a different way of living. And so few people actually live from their heart. They are letting circumstances and situations and people and their counsel and things like this can constrain them and force them to do things. And yet that's not what the scripture teaches. So anyway, I'm going to be going through a lot of things. I think that this is going to really be awesome. I'm excited about it. And also, in a sense, this is a very brief, very short uh, kind of biography of some of the things that God has done in my life. Again, this is our gift to you. I think it's going to be a blessing. So I encourage you to listen to our announcer. He's going to give you all of the information that you need to be able to get this. We'll also be offering other products that complement this as we go through the series. I don't know how long it'll go. I'm just going to share with you things that God has put on my heart, and I believe it'll be a blessing to you. So listen to our announcer as he gives you this information. And I encourage you to please call or write today to receive this little free booklet. And then jo join me again tomorrow as we continue to start going through this teaching on 20 revelations that will change your life. Andrew is offering his booklet, 20 Revelations That Will Change Your Life, as his free gift to you today. This booklet is limited to one free booklet per household and is available in the US, UK, Canada, and Australia. Contact us today to receive your free booklet. Andrew's complete series, 20 Revelations That Will Change Your Life, is available in a CD or TV DVD album and as a USB made from our daily television broadcast. This entire series is also available for audio download absolutely free from our website. You can become a Grace Partner through our website at awmi.net. 
While there, you can discover more product details and download additional free resources. Also, our products and additional resources are available in various languages through our website at awmi.net. You can also order resources or receive prayer by calling our helpline at 719-635-1111. We'd like to point out Andrew's upcoming speaking schedule. Mark your calendars to come meet Andrew at one of these events and let the Word of God transform your life. All of Andrew's upcoming live stream events are available to watch at awmi.net slash live. In the month of September, Andrew will be in Woodland Park hosting the Truth and Liberty Coalition Conference with guest speakers Congressman Doug Lamborn, Richard Harris, David Barton, Chad Connolly, Alex McFarland, Janet Porter, Lucas Miles, and Mohammed Faridi. Join us the following week for a special patriotic performance, the 9-11 Memorial Tribute. Then, Andrew will be speaking in Hayes, Kansas. Lastly, in September, Andrew will be back in Woodland Park hosting the Vision Conference with guest speaker Dwayne Sheriff. And in October, Andrew will be speaking in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Then join Andrew in Woodland Park for our annual Minister's Conference. Andrew will be joined by guest speakers Billy Epperhart, Mike and Carrie Pickett, Bob Yandian, Dwayne Sheriff, Bob Nichols, Greg Moore, and Wendell Parr. For more details on Andrew's next meeting in your area, visit our website at awmi.net. I'm pleased to announce that we now have my television program translated into Spanish. We have a lot of my materials available in Spanish, but let your friends know that we're now broadcasting our daily program in Spanish. you know that we now have a Truth and Liberty live call-in show every weekday and you can tune in from 3.30 to 5 p.m. Mountain Time and we are going to be discussing not only spiritual things but political things, just anything. It's a live call-in. You will actually get put on the air and we will interact with you and I believe it's going to be a blessing to you. So remember that's every weekday from 3.30 to 5 o'clock p.m. for our Truth and Liberty live call-in show.